Charles Florty, Thomas Thornton, Samantha Hopper, Courtney Holt, Brian Goff, Joni Davis, Jeff Shepard, Stephanie Torres, Annie Hampton, Abigail, Brandon Berg, and Charles Hanlon. What do all these people have in common? They've been brought home because of you guys. With all of the names and the cases that Jacob had spoke about, what the purpose here today is to just kind of bring everybody in, make it all inclusive, all of the cases, all of the families that we've helped, bring all of those into one video for you guys. Not only to just kind of recap the people that we've helped, but to also bring our emotions into it and let you know how we felt during everything and to just pay our respects as well. With Charles Florida case, we came in there knowing that this is gonna be a very difficult case. We had AWP with us. We searched numerous spots. With doing that, we weren't able to locate Charles at the time. When we came back, one of the law enforcement officers asked us if he could remove, if we could remove a potential missing person case vehicle. It was a 20 year old Cadillac. And let me tell you, this Cadillac was a disaster. Uh, there was a spot, uh, Greg Smith, the, the original detective on the case wanted us to search called Yellow Creek. So on our way there, we found some vehicles in the water, uh, stopped and dove on those. That was actually my first time getting to dive uh, non-local. Rounding the corner and finding that what at first appeared to be a mound, but Jacob instantaneously knew that it was a vehicle. See, oh, look at that. Check that out right there. The vehicle upside down. Wheels and wheels. I'm gonna have to get. We all kind of had this feeling that this was not just gonna be another vehicle that had been dumped in the water. Sonaring over it and over it, making sure that we we had a solid lock on it. Eric dove down. Eric was unable to locate any kind of plate or anything because of how silted out it was. It was covered in zebra mussels. Eric insisted at the time that, that Jacob get in the water, that Jacob was gonna be the one that would be able to get this done. I was on shore and I remember, I remember Jacob coming up and as soon as he said the first digit, I was done. That's it. That's it. Are you? Uh, Eric was fortunate enough that he was on the boat at the time to be able to, to catch that, that emotion, that raw, real emotion for us. 755XEL. Guys, we found him. Awesome job, dude. And and with that, it was it was a huge just sigh of relief we were we were able to bring home Charles to his family have him be laid to rest properly and also you know give this give this win to Jacob let him see what we've all seen you know for so long he he kind of was able to kind of believe in himself that he could do this so from there uh, everything else was kind of you know, procedures and, and getting law enforcement involved and, and getting the vehicle removed. And we, uh, we were able to do that all the next day. Once that was done, we kind of just were able to pack up and, and move on to our next case to help the next family. So with working with the AWP team, that would have been a blooper. That would have made the cut. <laughs> so working with the AWP team, it goes to show you that if we team up, a lot of things can get accomplished. You know, we were able to bring Charles Flaherty home, which who knows, I still may have been on, on a different different pond and a different lake, but we were able to come together and we were able to solve these cases together. You know, with bringing Charles home, Eric, it was, it was a feeling that I'll never forget. Um, as you guys will see on the video, I broke down and a lot of people, you know, they're like, oh, that was a lot of, that was a lot of cinematic stuff. No, the reason why I did that, it was an uncontrollable feeling because I, I finally was able to solve my first case by myself. And I was able to help a family and, and you know, it's a blessing to be able to do this. And it's because of you guys, I was able to. Um, I'm super proud of Eric from Ride or Dive. He, he 
was my rock on on diving he was right next to me throughout the whole recovery and, and how did you feel on this on this recovery the next day that you know we had found him when, and now we're able to bring him home how was your reaction toward it well it didn't really hit the next day because we just went straight into the procedures of you know connecting the car connecting the airbags lifting the car getting it connected to the tow truck and then once we got the tow truck it was a lot of waiting and anything we could do to help while they were lifting over that there was like that eight foot wall um, but we were still dressed out there were you know various points we jump in the water go help with something come back sit on the boat um, and then even after that like I, you don't realize it but like we took off and we went to we went and met the long family the next morning so 12 hours later we were in a different part of ohio working you know you have to completely shift and that case is gone now you're on the next one but like reflecting back now it's it's incredible what it was i mean for the just to see your confidence grow from your first your first solo recovery and just that you always had a little bit of doubt of can i really do this to now knowing you can do it it was pretty incredible from that standpoint yeah it was definitely something that i uh we felt accomplished um we were able to do this but you know it's i go back to to each and every one of you if it wasn't for you guys none of us could do this so thank you again the next solve case we're going to bring to you is toledo ben where we had brought home Thomas Thornton. Thomas Thornton had been missing for eight months. He had dementia. He was he was found by Jared from AWP. And when we were out there, we were able to team up and bring Thomas home. This is our vehicle. NJJ858. Um, to be a part of that was really special to know that somebody's grandpa, somebody's you know brother and, and uncle gets to come home you know he was a veteran and it's it's definitely a uh, a blessing to to know that we were able to help them in such a fashion where we came in jared put the boat in we didn't spend much time there and we were able to bring him home after recovering thomas thornton and bringing him home we literally turned around the very next day and we were in arkansas in Arkansas, we were searching for Samantha Hopper, her two-year-old daughter, Courtney Holt, as well as Samantha was eight months pregnant. We were out on Lake Dardanelle. We were again working with AWP. They had went down a smaller creek that was more fitted for the inflatable while they had asked us to go to, um, to a different part of Lake Dardanelle where the river, or where the bridge crossed over the lake back there. So we had your dad's bigger boat for that. So we, we hauled across the lake, um, got back down in there, started to sonar as soon as we got to that bridge area. Um, we did the first bridge. Everything was clear there. I don't even think there was any stumps or anything. No. Uh, made our way around that bend underneath the, the other portion where the bridge crosses over Lake Dardanelle. And again, almost immediately, you know, we found a vehicle and without hesitation, Jacob looked at me and said, Lindsay, we just found Samantha and Courtney. It's been in there for a long time, guys. And if this is the area that she usually travels, I'm gonna tell you that this is probably it. Not even knowing what kind of vehicle it was, not even scanning over it for a second or third time. It was an instantaneous, Lindsay, this is them. I had all the confidence in the world just because of how confident he was in it. So we did double check. We scanned over it another, gosh, 10 times at least different directions. Just to make, just to make positive that it was, it was that for it was, sure a vehicle and it was, you know, trying to get like a time frame on when it could have went in with the sonar. Um, you know, with, with Jared coming in on this case, and then them coming back and then them welcoming us to able to help was was awesome in itself that AWP allowed us to come in and, and work a case that they have, have already worked to come in and team up with them to, to help them bring Samantha home was amazing. I think the biggest thing 
after you had you had made the phone call to Jared saying, hey, Jared, we, we did find a car. It's smaller. It did fit the description in, in the Ford Temple that we were looking for. Looking up and seeing Samantha's family, uh, her daughter and her mom on the shore, that um, that's always the worst part for me because here I have to tell somebody, hey, we found a vehicle, but we don't know yet if it's yours or not. Um, so that's always kind of this line that I, I teeter on. Yes, we found something, which is great, but do I get to tell them, yes, it's your loved one and you get to, get to lay them to rest? Or do I have to tell them, hey, we found something, but it's, it's not what we're looking for. So Jared and Doug had made their way over to us. Uh, we took, well, you took Doug out on the boat along with Jared and Doug dove on the car. Samantha's car did not have plates on it because she had just recently purchased it. Uh, but we did know that it had a, a donut on one of the tires or there was a spare tire on, on one of them. Uh, so that's kind of how they used to identify it. Once it was confirmed that it was Samantha's vehicle, again, law enforcement was called. Uh, they actually had their own dive team. So it was something that you guys all just kind of, not sat and waited, but you guys were there as backup and, and whatever they needed, um, if, they ever, if they needed assistance or anything. We were, we were able to be there just in case. Um, we were able to transfer the information from diver to diver. Um, you know, they did a, a really good job in, in making sure that the car stayed intact. Um, Elmo's towing or Elmo's crane service came down and they were able to lift Samantha and her baby out of the water. And, um, you know, with, with all these cases that, that I, that I deal with, that we deal with, and even, you know, even the teams that are, that are also doing the search and recovery, there's a line there that we try not to cross and get, and get really off kilter on our feelings. But this one really, really <clears throat> got to me due to the fact that, you know, there's a baby out there that we'll never be able to see what it's like to live a life. I, I think with Samantha's case, it definitely was the one that, that affected everybody the most emotionally. Um, not just, not just Jacob, um, but, but everybody. So everybody that's involved in this has kids. Um, for me, it was more, uh, relating Samantha. My son is 18, Samantha was 19. So there was that correlation for me, but I think this is probably the case that probably got everybody, um, the most emotional. I know that at certain points in times, I think just about everybody had to go take a walk. Um, but at the end of the day, being able to look at Samantha's mom and saying for the first time in 23 years, you're going to go to bed tonight and you get to know where your daughter and your grandbabies are was probably the most amazing feeling for me. Um, you know, you watching tears roll down their face, but at the same time you're watching this weight lift off of their shoulders. Um, just this relief, um, being able to provide that for Desiree, who was only three at the time when her mom went missing. For her to know that her mom didn't leave, for her to know that her mom loved her and wanted to be, you know, part of her life, it wasn't that she just, she left one day. So that was something, you know, being able to provide, to provide that for the families is always gonna be the most important part for me at the end of the day. It's been a long day, this recovery of Samantha Hopper and her baby has really put a toll on everyone's heart. Um, she's been brought home. Um, after that, after we we brought Samantha and Courtney home, um, you know, we were on to our next case. I think for a lot of us, there is a little bit of um, emotion going into it. There's a little bit of reflection while you're doing it, but at the same time, for me, it's usually like a couple weeks after where I sit down and, and go back over everything that happened and took place, so. And then after that, we had ended our trip with Adventures with Purpose after another case in Little Rock um, that hopefully we'll be able to return to one day. And then from there, you and I actually went out searching on our own uh, for Karen Adams. And during Karen Adams, we were also made aware of Brian and Joni. Brian Goff and Joni Davis, uh, they had been a couple for 30 plus years, I think their family had said. Yep. They had been missing for approximately three and a half years. 
Uh, they went out to Pizza Hut, their favorite restaurant, on a Friday night and were never seen again. Um, so in us searching for Karen, we had some time allotted one evening that allowed us to go search for Brian and Joni. And again, same thing, as soon as that car popped up on the sonar, it was an instantaneous Jacob knew, like, this is it. We, we just found Brian and Joni. Big car, buddy. Squared. I'm gonna tell you that this is it. They go through. You can you can tell the vehicle. I mean, you can tell the size of the vehicle. You can actually see the description on it, like that. That sonar. Probably, I'll show you on the on the video. Um, I show you on one of these clips. You could tell. You could tell it was Joni and Brian's car. Um, there was no doubting. I think it was. Was it Buick? No, it was a. Yeah. Was it Buick? I think it was an Oldsmobile or Buick. It was. It was an older '90s model model car. I think. Regardless, you could tell, and uh, you know, I couldn't. I couldn't keep. <laughs> I had to dive on it that night. I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't wait for the next morning. It is verified. It is the vehicle. It is an Oldsmobile. And there's license plate. We found guys. Um, you had tried to. You had said, "Well, we'll dive it tomorrow." But I, just got I know Jacob well enough to know that he was not going to go back and sleep that night if we didn't take care of it. I know a lot of people question, like, "Why would you dive at night? It's dark under the water, no matter what." So yeah, regardless, we were gonna we were gonna dive it, um, and I wasn't gonna see anything from the daylight or dark. So we were able to bring him them home. Um, and like I said, I'll show you all the clips of, of each and every one that we have brought home. But uh, I think the next case that we worked on from there was... We had returned to the Jeff Shepard case. Returned to the Jeff um, Shepard case. Eric was with us for the first portion when we had searched for Jeff Shepard the first time um, when we had lost our camera. Yeah, with our first camera loss. So Eric was with us when we had searched the first time for Jeff Shepard. We were also searching for Martha Sue and Claude Shelton over in Corbin, Kentucky. Not being able to find anything from that first search, because we were the closest team, Nikki, who was one of Jeff's best friends, had contacted us and said, hey, we just found out some really, really big information. There's a pond that wasn't searched. Um, we thought it was, there wasn't a guardrail. We thought there was. Uh, so that's what had led Jacob and I to go back. But during that first search, we searched three or two or three areas oh we spent we spent all day searching there were two because uh, it started going out through the woods mm -hmm. and then we went towards the bar that he was last known to be at and we just kind of took that route um trying to figure out any waterways near there uh that's the one where nikki even got us permission we found a little a tiny little private pond right on the side of the highway mm-hmm and Nikki got the sheriff out there. There were signs posted. We're in Kentucky. I think we were in Kentucky. Tennessee. We were in either Tennessee or Kentucky. It's right on the border. And uh, there were signs posted saying, private property, keep out. Uh, we did not want to roll up to that door unannounced. So we called. There was five signs that said no. Five signs. Five signs. <laughs> drive up. There were, a, there were more multiple signs. There were enough where we're like, we're not going to risk going to that door alone. So the sheriff was more than happy to come out and got permission. We searched that as well. And uh, we left there. And again, that was the second time that I was inter personally interacting with a family or close relatives on the case. And like when when you called me and told me, hey, Nikki just called and we got new information. Like I was like, go, go search. Yeah. I wanted to go. I had to work. I couldn't, couldn't leave right away. But it was like, go. If, if we've got something else and we can give them answers... Go try to get answers to them. I still remember. I don't know why it sticks out, but I remember vividly when uh, Jacob signed. Did you sign the hand for Nikki's child? I did. Sign the hand and, and Nikki's child. I'm never washing my hand again. <laughs> Just one of those moments. But Nikki and them were, were amazing. And meeting Jeff's brother that day as well. Yeah. He helped He helped get the boat when the starter wasn't working right. Yeah, they, they were amazing. With recovering Jeff Shepard, it was super cold that day. Super cold. Um, 
Nikki contacted us and said that there was a <sighs> there was another pond that was supposedly supposed to have been checked that actually wasn't checked um, due to the fact that they thought the waters were polluted enough from a semi truck driver driving off into it that uh, it was unsafe for people to sonar or actually dive into the water. Um, we immediately looked it up and and I think it was Nikki or, or Lindsay sent me the picture of the uh, of the guardrail actually being busted on a Google Earth image, which was around three to four years ago. With that new information, I told Lindsay, I said, if you look at Google Earth and see the way that the road makes a little slight turn to the left, going around that highway that he was on, that was parallel with the, with, and I'll show you a picture of it, with the pond, if he was to have fallen asleep or if he was intoxicated enough where he passed out or, you know, due to the fights that he had, maybe he had an issue and passed out. He could have veered off and went off the side and we were under the understanding that, that it was searched already, so none of us searched it. We went out there, we searched. Um, it didn't take me and Graham but 20 minutes get the boat ready, get out there on the water. At first, I looked at the projection and tried to estimate where the car would be and it wasn't there, so I was like, man. Water temperature is 53 degrees. If the vehicle was in here, it would be right up here, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. You know, he's not here. We're gonna continue to search today. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, his truck shows up. Look over here. This is where I turned. See that? Yeah. It's a big truck. It is. It's a big, big truck. It's got a big shadow on it too. On the sonar. And I said, wow, here it is, Graham. This is the truck. No doubt in my mind, this is the truck. So we were able to recover him and uh, bring Nikki and her family some answers. Um, I know Nikki is a close friend of his. Um, his family and his brother his brother mostly had been with us the whole time through AWP and us, and it was it was a it was amazing to bring him home and. And if you actually look at it, he was. He was around 38 years old. It's the same age as I am. I'm getting, I, mean, I turned 39, but he's around the same age as I am. And it just gets you to thinking, you know, just, just watch out what you do and, and, and be sure that if you're going to drink, make sure you get someone to take you home. This may or may not have been prevented. We don't know the whole facts, but just remember, don't drink and drive. And if you do, um, if you do drink, get somebody to drive you home. So along the way, we have been fortunate enough to have some amazing sponsors. Some of the ones that got Jacob started are Scout Inflatables with the Scout 430 boat. Absolutely incredible boat. I'm pretty sure it is untippable. And I've watched Jacob fall off of it and it still hasn't tipped over. Big Blue dive lights have been incredible with helping us um, get uh, the big blue dive light that Jacob has as well as helping us replace the one that was stolen There is also sniper marine that is something that allows us to use our mega live most effectively To really give us that full scan of what we're looking at underneath the water Detector warehouse has been incredible in donating to Jacob several different metal detectors as well as the new one the dais They they the helped DS2. him the dais too. They helped him get that, which is going to only help searches underwater, especially in no viz situations. We also were gifted uh, from Bahio sunglasses, our whole team, something that is kind of overlooked in, in, in a need and in a necessity. It not only helps us take glare off of sonars, it helps us see under the water a little bit better, but also just protects us because we're on the water almost every day. So whether the sun is shining or not, 
the, you know, the weather conditions can be really harsh. So that's something that helps us as well. We also have the backing of Brute Magnetics. Brute Magnetics has been amazing in the, the magnets that they have donated. That sounds like a frog. They have been amazing in the magnets that they have donated to us. That's something that allows us to lock onto vehicles, gives the divers a guideline down. And because they're so strong, when we make that solid connection, it gives you guys, a, it gives the divers, you know, a solid point to, if there is current or something, that magnet's coming off. So it allows them to get down to the cars or whatever it is that we're diving on more safely. We also want to thank everybody who has donated monetarily through PayPal, Venmo, Cash App, mailed in checks, all of the memberships, anything like that, as well as we had just recently announced our Amazon wish list and it was absolutely overwhelming the things that we received so quickly. So many of the things that we needed were fulfilled almost instantaneously. It was, it was incredible the backing the support that you realize that you know i didn't realize that we had so much of that but we we really did so thank you to everyone for that thank you to all of our sponsors and thank you to everybody who just watches shares likes and subscribes the next case brings us to uh, waco texas where we with awp found stephanie torres uh, she had been missing for a little over four years brazos river right there in waco texas uh, that that was an interesting day, period. Um, we started out, that was where NBC had come to film with AWP. We started out in the the park in, on the Brazos River, and we never even left the park. I think we went from the east side of the park to the west boat ramp, and that's where Jacob was the first to see it on sonar. We weren't even in the water for about an hour. Found three vehicles right by the boat ramp. This right here, I ran over top of it. That's in direct line of that, Lindsay. <clears throat> that could possibly be her car. Uh, so we pulled over there and Doug and Jacob got dressed out and dove. And I remember I was tending the line. We dove from, from the shore, tending the line for Jacob when he went out. He was out there, you know, at first it's just five minutes, then 10, 15 minutes. And at that point, me, Lindsay, and Doug all looked at each other and were like, I think he found it. It is a key. This is my mom. This is my Was the uh, what color was the car? Silver and bluish. Yes. It's a Kia. So then Doug got uh, he got his mask and everything back on, and Doug and Jacob went out one more time just to make sure that we had the right vehicle. Um, they got a picture of the vehicle from Stephanie's family, and then. Uh, we were able to go down and confirm. At that point, we called law enforcement and uh, we did not do the, the recovery ourselves. Law enforcement had their dive team come down, but Jacob and Doug sat there explaining to the divers exactly where the car was, how it was positioned, and everything that was needed in order to be able to, to pull the car. Edge up the front end. Also with these hooks, these are spring loaded, push, they'll either come open either which way okay so there's a lot of there's a locking mechanism that won't let it come back out so make sure that you guys know how to do that because you're not going to be able to see under there that was that one was was another one with the, the family present when we were working and i don't i the emotion of the family just the the raw emotion of the uh, Stephanie's two children was heartbreaking. I, I don't know another word for it, but heartbreaking. Just seeing them as they finally had answers of what happened to their mother four years ago. I want to give a special, special, special thank you to each and every one of you. What you're doing for these families is amazing. And uh, 
keep it up. You know, just uh, support, watch, share, more so. Show love to these families that are that are missing their lost loved ones. Jared started a beautiful thing, and I'm I'm glad I could continue to do this and and help out. So thank you. Which brings us to the next case, which if you guys do know about the the break-in that we had, um, that was uh, an emotional roller coaster with uh, with everything that was stolen. We had about eighteen, about seventeen to eighteen thousand dollars worth of equipment stolen. Along with that was the information on Andy Hampton. Um, part of it. So I'm going to show you guys my part in my section of what I was doing with helping Jared. Um, we did go down a small creek, Jared and, and, and Doug. They searched and searched and searched and didn't find anything. And out of nowhere, Jared said, hey, there's a reservoir about eight miles out. Let's go check it. When Doug and I put the boat in, super cold, it was like 20 degrees outside. We were able to locate Annie and, and bring her home to her family. All right, guys, let's see if we can bring her home. She needs to come home. She's got a family here. All right, see ya. Mm -hmm. This is her. you guys this is able to be done somebody's mom somebody's possible grandma sister she's been brought home family members been brought home so thank you guys for all your support and what it is that we do we're gonna rig this up we're gonna put endless loops through the uh, through the rims and um, get a rope get this out With the perseverance and the dedication that we have towards all this, we can help these families. And uh, with with Jared coming up with that idea, it was brilliant, and we were able to able to bring Annie home. And like I said on this video, I'll show you a little bit of of me helping out um, while recovering Annie. I'm just I'm super grateful to be able to bring her home and and uh, to help that family out because. They didn't know where she was, and we finally brought her home. With Annie Hampton's recovery, again, we teamed up with AWP. AWP, in my opinion, they're a great team. They, they mean good. Um, they're good people, and, and it's a blessing to be able to assist them and, and help these families together as a team. We had returned to Steubenville, Ohio 
to remove a vehicle that we had believed belonged to Charles Hanlon. When we returned, we did have Britain from Depths of History with us. We knew that there were several vehicles in the marina, but we were going back for, for that black Ford F-250. In doing so, we first had to remove a navigator out of the way, and then we were able to pull the vehicle that was later confirmed to be that of Charles Hanlon. Charles Hanlon remains were not in the vehicle, which in this case is something that is a good thing because it's going to allow law enforcement to follow leads that they've been given over the years. The most important part for me in pulling out the vehicle of Charles Hanlon, not only was it to give you know his family some kind of answers, but it was also to be able to help kind of put a, a finishing note on something that Sheriff Fred Abdullah Sr. had started while his son Fred Abdullah Jr. was in his position. And he, just like his father, supported us 110%. He was there with us every day. They spared no expense on what they could offer to us. They made sure we had everything we needed. They, they went as far as to make sure that we had food every day and water every day and protection every day. So thank you to Jefferson County. Uh, Fred Abdullah Sr. was an amazing man and I'm extremely grateful to continue the relationship with his son. Fred Abdella Jr. This is the information we're bringing out to you, you guys who support us, who are new to the channel. We're, we want to bring out the information to you guys on what we have done and what we're able and capable of doing because of you guys with all the donations and all of this stuff coming in, we're able to get out there and do this full time. Abigail Brandenburg, Abigail Brandenburg, was missing for only six days. Beautiful woman with two beautiful kids and a loving, a loving fiance who just, just wanted her home. And one of our subscribers actually contacted us about this case and said, hey, Jacob, you know, I don't feel as, as it, the place was searched as well as it should be. So is there a possible way of you being able to come out and search this? While we were working a case in Indiana, I said, hey, we're able to come to you. We're only an hour and a half away. Get Christian and get the family and, and, and we'll be there in an hour and a half. Well, about two hours later, we were there. We were able to search for less than 30 minutes and was able to find her. Um, you know, with a vehicle being so new and a case being so new, it was off kilter from what we do. With it being off kilter of a searching, we were able to locate her vehicle due to the fact that Team Waters from St. Louis Dennis and Tammy Waters from Team Waters was able to tell me and show me what a vehicle looks like after it's just in the water for a few days. We're gonna see some type of crazy object that is going to resemble a bunch of flashes. It's amazing to know that we have the support from another local search and recovery team as Dennis and Tammy. Dennis and Tammy are the godfather and, and godmother of, of searching. So thank you guys for your support also and to training all of us to, to be able to do this. Other than that, we were able to bring Abby home and and the the family will know where she is and and they can, you know they can heal and it's just, it's just an amazing thing that you guys do for us. Wanted to bring this out to you to show you guys that we have, in the past nine months, brought 10 people home. And that's because of you guys. So thank you so much for all your support. Continue to support us. Go to chaosdivers.com. Check out our merchandise that allows us to put fuel in the vehicle. Go in there and check out our Amazon wish list like Lindsay was talking about. That allows us to do the job that we do. We are here today at Mermit Springs to tell you about our last solve case. The significance of Mermit Springs is astronomical to our success 
It is where Jacob and Eric both have received all of their training, as well as a ton of support from so many of the instructors, the divers, as well as the owner here, Glenn Faith. So thank you to all of you for everything that you've done for us. Thelonious Lamar Green was last seen on June 4th, leaving a graduation party. He was headed home to eat dinner, check on his dad and get to bed. He never made it. With that being said, we were contacted by Ethel, his wife, when she had felt that all other options had been exhausted. We had agreed to come down. We let her know we'd be down there within a week or so to help do everything we could to bring Lamar home. In that, we had searched one location, found a vehicle, wasn't the one we were looking for. We could clearly tell that on sonar. From there, we were gonna return the next day to dive on that vehicle and potentially answer, you know, answers for, or give answers to another family. When we returned the second day, the tide was going out and it was incredibly too shallow for us to put our boat in. So we chose to go to our second location, Willtown Bluff, where even when the tide is out, it is much deeper. In doing so, we put the boat in the water, we began to sonar, didn't find too much to the left of the boat ramp. We changed directions, we went to the right. Within 30 minutes, we had found what we knew was to be Lamar's truck. This is about as good as I'm going to get it. It is construed due to the fact I was turning, trying to get a good angle at it. But I'm almost, I'm almost for certain at the truck. And the reason why is you got the square back in, which is the tailgate. It didn't have a lot of detail to it. Not a lot of structure because the silt and the sediment had not had time to to go over it and give us that hard feedback that we were looking for. Even though we weren't able to tell if it was a truck right away, I think it was something that Jake and I both knew this was it. This is exactly what we had been looking for. A skewed image that was just fitting dimensions. We were able to finally go over it at just the right angle and we were able to catch the shadow. It was a truck upside down. We could see that it had a ball hitch on it. We could see that it had a sidestep, which Lamar's truck both had. We were gonna dive that Friday. However, with rain and a coastal storm coming in, we weren't able to. So we called the dive for safety reasons, knowing we would return on Saturday. Saturday morning, we had spoken with Ethel and letting her know what we had found, letting her know not to get her hopes up, but that we had found a vehicle that was matching what we were looking for. We let her know we were gonna go dive and kind of the steps from there getting to the boat ramp again, put our boat in, went out. We remarked the truck, went back to the boat dock and Jacob prepared to dive again. Right as we were getting ready to get on the water, again, another heavy rainfall that lasted for about 10 or 15 minutes. As soon as that was clear, we hit the water, knowing there was another storm coming in, but we had a short window of time to work in. We went down, we anchored ourselves to one of our markers. Jacob got in the water and as soon as he got in the water, I think he was quite surprised you know, and, and how fast, even though it looked calm on top, how fast the riptides in the current were moving underneath of him. Oh, this current's strong. Oh, yeah. He was able to grab the rope, get down as quickly as possible. And in doing so, he had gotten tossed around a little bit in, in between the eddy and the current. I think it's probably one of the very quickest dives that I've ever seen Jacob do. Almost as quickly as he went down, he was right back up on the surface. And at first I, I really thought that he was coming up to say that we, were, we weren't on the vehicle or it was, it was a box of some sort. He placed the plates on the boat. Unfortunately, the look on my face is what gave it away to Jacob that we had just found Lamar Green's truck. We found him. From there, it was all mental preparation, uh, getting back to the boat ramp, speaking with law enforcement, speaking with his wife, Ethel, never a conversation that you want to have, but it's something that we do have to do often. Charleston County Sheriff's Department arrived quickly on scene with the deputies and the chain of command arriving shortly thereafter. A plan was put in place for the dive team to go in and remove the vehicle. With all of that being said, it was 
Um, it was a little bit saddening for us to not be able to, to be a part of it, just to see it through. It's something that Jake and I both like to do, kind of be that representation for the family and the voice for the voiceless. Um, but we were able to at least stay near the scene until the conclusion and Lamar's truck was removed and taken. I think it was just within a day or two, the coroner's report came out, confirmed that the remains were that of Thelonious Lamar Green. And again, speaking with Ethel, just sending her our condolences and thanking her for trusting us with this. It is never an easy thing to have to do this job, but it's also, it's also so, so heartwarming to be able to offer something to a family that they haven't had in days, weeks, months, and years. So with that, we send our condolences to all of the families that we have been able to help. And we want those that we haven't been able to find their lost loved one to know that we will be back and we won't stop until they are found. Thank you.